Hey, everyone, and welcome to Art Starts Explores. Uh, my name is Kay Slater, and I am going to be leading this week's workshop um, on landscapes. Also with us in the chat channel, you'll see Leah Horlick, our program manager. She is available throughout today's session if you have any questions, any comments. If you want to share what you're working on, we would love to see it. If you're working with your, uh, your whole family, make sure you get permission from a parent, uh, guardian, um, or adult in the room who's working with you before you post anything. But we would love to see what you're working on. Um, because my camera is up high and is filming what I'm working on, I can't always see your comments. But Leah is there um, throughout the session, and um, if you leave a comment for me, I'll see it at the end of our session um, at 12 when we wrap up. So from 11 to 12 today, we are going to be focused on landscapes, and uh, I'm excited to have you here with us. So I'm going to move that out of the way. I'm going to take the talk bubble of there because it is now 11 and we are starting. And as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at landscapes this week. So this is our second workshop um, on landscapes. Last weekend, Saturday at 11 to 12, we also were looking at landscapes. And we explored things like how seasons, so um, the fall or the spring or the summer, um, and where we are in the province or the country, especially if you live um, on Turtle Island or specifically north, uh, the north part of it or in Canada, it's a really huge space. So if you're in the west uh, where I am, um, the, you might see a certain kind of tree. Um, you might see um, a certain kind of tree that looks a certain way during the springtime that might look different in the fall. But that would be completely different than if you're on the far other side of the country um, on the east that you might see, maybe if you even saw the same tree, it might look a little different because their temperatures are different. How um, high or low they are in relation to the ocean is going to affect how hot or cold they are. How north or south they are on the globe, on the earth, is also going to affect how the land looks. Um, how long humans have been setting up cities in those spaces uh, versus other places, uh, farmland versus city land. So all those things affect how the land looks and how landscape is different. We explored that last week. We explored this concept of going outside. I stayed in the studio, but I encouraged you to go outside with your papers and pens and uh, check out something it's the French word called plein d'air, which basically means a lot of air. So you go outside um, into the landscape to actually do your drawings or your paintings. We talked about orientation of a page or a frame, about how when you are looking through your camera or you're looking through uh, your viewfinder, that when the top and the bottom of the frame or your camera um, is longer or wider than it is tall, that is a landscape orientation and how, when it's up and down so that the longer edges are on the left and the right side 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 that that's a portrait orientation so landscape comes up as the word there and we also looked at the idea of equivalence so that's when you draw one thing one way and then you try and do it multiple ways whether that's in different mediums so if we start with pencil crayon and then we go and use pencil or we use paint uh, but we draw the same thing that's an example of an equivalent. And then lastly, we thought about landscapes um, that had buildings in it. And then we used our imagination to guess what a land might look like before or even after it had a building in it. So we're gonna build on all those things that we looked at last week. And if you missed out and you wanna check it out, we save all of our videos, both on Facebook and YouTube. But the easy way to find all of our videos is to go to artstarts dot com slash explores dash online and there you can find all of our previous videos but also a pdf worksheet uh, worksheet um, that you can have you can find another activity um, if you're looking for more inspiration on this week's theme so if this is your first time with us welcome we're so happy to have you if you've been here before you know what's coming up next that's right the three rules of explorers so we always like to make sure 
um, before we get really into it, that we uh, look at the kind of rules or ways that we like to set up our workshops so that we're all thinking um, in a similar way and making space for ourselves. So first, the first rule of explorers is respect. We like to practice respect. Sometimes we're not perfect at it. We like to practice respect by checking in with ourselves, seeing how we're doing today. If we're making with other people, and hopefully you have some other people you, you're making along with, whether that's your cousin, your neighbor, your grandparent, your teacher, a friend, um, you can check in with each other. Ask how they're doing this morning. Tell them how you're doing this morning. Maybe you're, you woke up grumpy and you wanna be here and you wanna make something, but you're moving slowly this morning. And that's, that's just a good way for everybody around you to know that it's okay if you're moving a little slow. We want to practice respect with, for our tools. So uh, that means cleaning up when we're all done. If we get paint on a pair of scissors or we, um, we are cutting, we want to make sure that we are respectful of the surfaces that we're, we're working on so that we don't cut through or make a mess behind. And if we do, we clean up right away. So that's a way of practicing respect with our tools. And then we also want to respect the land. So the way that I practice respect for the land is that I acknowledge that my workshop, where you're seeing this video, is hosted on the stolen and unceded land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Musqueam, tsleil and Skohomish people. And I'm a guest on these lands, and so I want to both acknowledge where I am, the people who, who have been here and are here since time immemorial, and I want to practice being the most respectful guest I can be while I am a visitor on these lands. And so that's another way that I practice respect. Number two is that nothing is for keeps. I always encourage you to go to the recycling bin. The paper that we're going to be drawing on today, I've taken it from my recycling bin. Um, I, I think that if you have permission to go through your recycling bin, you can find so many cool things in there from cardboard, to paper, to plastic, um, to drink containers. I always like to use the top of, um, whoop, see, I made a mess, that's okay. Uh, Takeout containers when I'm painting, you can see some ink residue from last week that I was using. And this is just the top of a takeout container. And I found that in the recycling bin. And that means that you don't have to really worry about when you put a whole bunch of paint or you're using um, ink, that you're going to mess up a nice glass or cup from the kitchen, right? So that was from my recycling bin. Um, and then the last thing is, is that when we're all done making today, we're going to take it all apart. So whether you use glue, whether you drew on a surface, whether you painted, when we're all done, we're not keeping it. And might, that might make you really nervous at the beginning because you're used to making things and then somebody keeps it. Maybe uh, when you draw things, somebody usually puts it up on the fridge or they, they share it um, or take a picture of it. Well, it's okay to take a picture of it, but what we're going to try and practice today is that everything that we make when we're finished, we're going to put it back into the recycling bin or we're going to throw it out. And that's, that's just a way of um, being really free so that we're not trying to make something perfect. It's just we can take it all apart when we're done. And that leads to number three, which is no expectation. So why, why are we taking it all apart when we're done? The reason is because we're trying a whole bunch of things today. And something might not work, something might not be perfect, and that's okay. It's even more okay though when you start out at the beginning of your making session and go, whatever happens, happens. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. And if it's really, really good, I promise you that you'll be able to do something even better the next time you make it. So this week what we're trying to do is we're trying to make things that at the end we could rip up or we could crumple or we could just throw into the recycling bin. And if that's scary, that's okay. Think about that. Ask yourself why it's scary. It can be really, it can be really scary, but it can also be really exciting to go, it doesn't really matter what's gonna happen. Let's just see. And that's a good way of practicing surprise. Always asking yourself, what will happen if? And then try something that you didn't expect. So that's a lot of talking about how we set up our explorers. This is the same every week. We always try and think about it go over it again before we start every week because uh, these are all important to making and uh, not being kind of fearless trying whatever happens 
So if you tuned in a little bit early or you came in right at 11 or you're watching this later in the week, you'll see that I drew uh, a really, really fast picture of a landscape before we got started. And in real time, this, this drawing took me five minutes. It was really fast. I didn't really think about it very much, um, but I wanted to imagine a landscape uh, where I was standing somewhere. So I'm pretending that I'm the one who, who uh, took this picture or I'm the one who's standing right here and looking out on kind of a hill over here. And then I wanted there to be a whole bunch of hills. So the idea that the hills would go all the way back to mountains and then behind the mountains or above the mountains, there would be some sky. And I always like drawing clouds. So I drew a couple of clouds. And so when we're looking at landscapes, when we're looking at the idea of uh, trying to draw a landscape, it might be really tempting to just draw the first thing that you see in front of you. So if you're in a park or you're in a yard, whether it's a schoolyard or a backyard, um, front yard or a park, um, you might just want to draw the thing that you see immediately in front of you. And so if you were thinking about a park, here, I'm gonna move this picture to the side and I'll take a piece of paper here. Let's think of a playground and your playgrounds may look really different, but I, I'm gonna think really fast. And I'm gonna pretend like I'm a bird that's flying above a park and go, okay, if I was to come into the park, I have, I have driven in my uh, cousin's car and we parked in the parking lot. If this is where the parking lot was. This is a path and our car is now parked right here. And these are the, the parking lines. So maybe there are other cars that are parked in this parking lot. So you can see I'm, I'm looking down. This is the top of the car. You, can, you can't even see the wheels because they're underneath the car, right? So that, that's a car right there and that's a car right there. So I'm coming into the parking lot like this and the bird is watching me from above. And the first thing I see is maybe some grass right here. Maybe there's grass all around the parking lot. So here's the grass and I'm gonna show that by just doing a couple of lines. How do you draw grass? If you were going to be looking at grass from above, like a bird, pretending you were a bird, how would you draw grass? I'm just drawing with grass because grass kind of looks like this, right? There are usually blades of grass that happen. And so it's just easy for me to go like this. But you could also take color, like a pencil crayon, and you could just color it in green if you were just imagining, right? So, I'm drawing a picture, it might be really easy to just think, okay, well, I'm just gonna draw the first thing that's in front of me. But what if it's just grass? It's kind of a boring picture, right? If we were thinking about flipping the picture this way. So now we're gonna pretend like it's us again. So this is the bird looking down. The bird is flying over here and is looking down at the picture. If we're looking from the, from the car, we just got out of the car. If I'm just gonna draw grass, that's probably just gonna look like this, right? It's just gonna be a page of grass. And sure, that's a landscape, but unless you're gonna get down and actually look at the grass, it might be really hard for you to show a picture to somebody and go, what do you think? What do you think of my landscape? And they'd go, well, it's just green, right? So one way of doing that would be to get right down on your stomach and look right at the grass, right? Get your eye so that it is level. And then all of a sudden, maybe you would start to see how the grass looks, each blade of grass, right? And maybe as you really focus on each blade of grass, you'll see maybe there's a bug on the grass, or maybe there's some funny dirt under the grass that you wouldn't have noticed. And the bird probably can't see all those details because they're up high, right, and flying. And if you're just standing, looking really fast, and you're trying to look across the park at where your friends are or where your uh, grandparents, where your foster parents have set up their picnic for the day. Um, you're really just looking for a certain thing. You're not really looking at the land, right? So we're trying to, we're trying to practice looking at the land so that we can transfer it over. So we want to look beyond the first thing that we look at. So beyond the grass, maybe there is a path, right? And maybe the path is actually separated in two. This path, has a bike on it, and this one has a person walking, just so that they can show that this path here is for people to walk, and this path is for people to bike. Well, for this one, right, we just drew, we just drew the, 
the grass. How am I supposed to how am I supposed to show the the sidewalk if I just drew grass here? That's okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to did I bring an eraser over this week? I think I have one behind me. I'm lucky because I'm in my, my studio. But if you have to go running for uh, an eraser at any time or if you need to pause this video or come back later don't worry we've always got the video later that you can come back and check it out so i'm gonna erase it because that's okay right i made a guess i went okay well how would i draw grass but i want to draw more grass so what i did here remember this so the idea is that if we were looking at this so you're looking down right now like a bird at my Thing. but if here so this we've got we've got my my little um, my little friend here mini mini host and if they were looking at the park right so you're looking down but their eyes are now facing this way if they were looking at the park standing here right but they're looking at the picture like this how are we going to now draw this part right the bike path here well, we've made some space on the page and it kind of comes next. So it makes sense that if our feet are down at the ground, that we would start building a picture from the ground so that this line at the bottom becomes where our feet are, right? So it's kind of natural to assume that the bottom of a picture is where the ground is. So if you think about that, it's a little bit easier to not color the whole page in green because the grass only comes up so far, right? And then as our eyes go up the page and we notice the next thing, then we can start drawing the path. So I'm gonna draw a path here. And what do you notice when you're looking at a path that's farther away from the grass? You might notice that, at least I've noticed, that the path that is farther away from you actually looks smaller than if you were to walk right up to the path, right? So when you look at the path when you're far away, it looks skinny and small, but then when you walk up to the path, it looks way wider. And so we wanted to do that so that even if the path looks really big, I've kind of flattened it out. And this, this is a really, this is the skill that artists try and learn all their life. Um, it's something called perspective. It's the idea that when you look at something really far away, um, it's smaller. And then when you bring something really close to your face, it gets bigger. Um, and that's, uh, that's a way of perceiving depth or how deep, how far or how close something is. And you can do that by taking something in your hand right now. I took my pencil and my face is over here at the camera here and I brought the pencil far away and then I brought the pencil close to me to notice that it gets really, really big when it gets right up to my face and then really small when it gets far away. So same thing with the bike path, right? So this is farther away. And if you think about the size of the car here relative to how big that bike path is, it's a pretty big bike path far away here so I've made it a small line. So continuing to think about a park and your drawing could look really different. Maybe you don't have a bike path, uh, bike path and if it's your backyard you really probably don't have a bike path but maybe you have a path to a shed. If you're in an apartment building maybe there is a playground or maybe there is a fence. So this can be a fun way of practicing landscape when you pretend like you're looking up high from like a bird or as if you were a person that was looking where your feet were at the bottom of the picture. So let's keep going. I'm gonna keep going with my imaginary drawing right now, but remember yours can be looking completely different or you could be trying to draw the exact same thing um, and then try again later with another picture or a place that you find. Okay, so there's my bike path. What's beyond the bike path? I'm gonna pretend like it's a playground. And so, that's okay that this is over at the side. Maybe my drawing is over here. And remember, we're gonna get rid of it. So if you wanna practice how to draw things at the side of your picture before you bring it in over here, that's okay. So I've pretended that there is a playground right here. So maybe there's um, a wood, a little wood fence or a little wood step around the outside of the playground. And that's just to make um, kind of a, a fence barrier between the grass and the um, playground that's there. And so maybe the playground is made up of um, gravel or mulch or a rubbery, a rubbery base, right? What's, what's the ground underneath the playground nearest you or at your schoolyard made of? I'm going to pretend mine is made out of that 
bouncy rubber because I really like that and I'm just going to kind of give that texture there. And then let's say that there is a swing set here and I'm going to show that by drawing like this. So those are those legs at the side and then the swings are here. Remember I'm always trying to imagine what it looks like if I'm looking above when I'm drawing it like this. And then maybe there is one of those climby. Oh, actually, let's do monkey bars over here. So maybe monkey bars over here. Right? If you think about if you're ever standing underneath a monkey bar or looking above a monkey bar, right? You can see them like this. But maybe if you're looking on the side and you look at it over here, it's going to look a little different. And then here, I'm going to do a big climbing gym here. So that's where you climb up to where you can be taller than everybody else. Maybe there's that plastic dome that you can look out there. I'm going to push slide here. Slide came there. And then maybe there's one of those big nets. Have you ever seen the, the, the rope nets that they have sometimes where you have to climb up the rope? That can be really, really hard, especially if there's lots of other people on the rope. Okay, so that's my playground. And you know what? I think this park this park has a whole bunch of grass all around it. Oh, you know what? I want to do one more thing. Over here in the corner, I think I'm going to pretend like there's a baseball diamond. So I'm going to turn the baseball diamond this way. Right, those big fences that you see sometimes. We want to put them this way, right? And so if you were a landscape architect, that was somebody who we talked about last week in landscapes, somebody who plans parks, why would you want to have the fence like this. So this is home base right here. And then there's third base. There's first base. And there's the pitcher's mound. Why would we want to have the fence in this direction? Why do you think the architect planners did that? So the batter is standing here. They're all ready to go. The pitcher throws the ball. The ball is knocked out of the park. They probably put the fence this way because if the ball went wild, right, if somebody hit it and it bounced back or the pitcher missed it and it went far, we wouldn't want the ball to go into the playground where people aren't thinking about it, right? And that's what people who design parks, who are doing landscape architecture, they have to be thinking about those things so that they don't install something, they don't make something in a park, they don't put something in a schoolyard or a public park, or a um, one of those really pretty botanical gardens where there's lots of people who are going through who have different needs. Um, if you have somebody who's in a mobility device, how they're going to be able to get in there because if they move around with wheels, are they gonna be able to get into the playground okay? Those are all the kind of things that a landscape architect thinks about. And we can be thinking about too when we're imagining a park, right? So I'm going to keep going. Your park might look very, very different, but if you haven't thought about that before and you were just making up a park, think about that for a second. How would somebody who wanted to come to the park who was in a wheelchair or had a uh, scooter or a um, cane, how would they be able to move around your park? Would they be stuck in some places? Would they be able to um, watch from the side? Do you have benches? Have you ever been with somebody who is uh, older or who gets tired um, or just has, has some challenges to be able to get around? Where are they gonna sit in your imaginary park? Or if you're looking at a real park, look for the places that there are to sit. Maybe there's a bench. Maybe in the playground, they've added seats, right? And those, those can be for people who need that spot to sit down, right? And so if you're playing near those seats and you don't need to sit in those seats and you see somebody who does need those seats, right? We wanna make sure we, we move out of the way so that they can sit in those spots because the park was planned to have them there. Okay, so I'm bringing some color into mine and you can do this too, right? You're drawing your, your park right now. Um, you can bring some color in. So I've just shown that my baseball diamond maybe has some brown gravel. And then I'm going to make the 
my pictures now to slightly different color. Is that a different color? Oh, it's kind of gold. But at least it shows that there's a different color for the pictures now. All right. And this grass is darker than this grass. Maybe that's maybe that's what my park looks like. Maybe this is fake grass. Have you ever been to um, a park where they they have this kind of plasticky grass? It's usually called astroturf. Sometimes you can find them in soccer fields or near um, tennis uh, tennis courts. And there's so many things that you can find in different kinds of parks, right? Your park could look very very different from mine. Um, and here, I'm just going to put a couple of those blades of grass again, like I had over here, just to show. Okay, so this is still our bird's eye view. We drew all of this from above. There was the there was the crow that came in and looked down at the park while they kept going on to visit their other crows. So, last time we looked at it this way, where we had our, our person standing at the bottom and we're looking over. Now what we need to do is we need to draw these pieces here. We want to draw these pieces, this playground here, over here, as if we were looking at it on its side. So two things we want to keep in mind is the first is that the playground is quite far away. So if we are pretending that we are like standing right here, right? And I'm going to mark myself on the map with this circle or with a star, because I actually want to share something with you. When I was, um, when I was doing some research, I learned that the reason that we don't want to put X's on a map near uh, where where we're standing, um, and if you've ever seen a funny like cartoon map, like a pirate map, sometimes they'll put like an X that marks the spot where a treasure is, and that's one thing. But if we want to show where we are, it's better to put a circle or a star. And the reason is is because um, there's actually some history where treaties that were signed, especially in North America, between um, settlers and uh, colonists between indigenous people, they would usually sign those treaties with an X because the languages were different, right? Uh, if you watched our um, session on alphabets, you know that here um, in April, when we're speaking in English, we use the A, B, C, and we have a name um, that we can draw using those letters. Well, um, a lot of indigenous people around the world don't have a writing system that is exactly the same. So when people would come in and try and make deals with um, the people who lived here before these new people came in, they would sign these letters, or sometimes they don't sign the letters, which is why we in BC are on stolen land. They would sign it with an X, right? And sometimes um, people will ask you to do that, you'll to write your name, and you'll see in cartoons, same thing, that they sign an X instead of signing their name. So because we want to be aware that maps and land is connected with treaties, and especially here um, in the West that runs unceded land, we want to mark ourselves with a star or a circle because that X has a history to it that, we, um, that we're not doing when we draw maps like this. So that's what I recommend. What other icons could you use? What other pictures could you use to show where you are on a map? A circle, a triangle, uh, you could draw a little person, right? I encourage you not to draw an X. So we've got this map here. And we're looking from this spot. So when we look at when we look through our eyes at a landscape, we're probably only able to look at so much at once, right? We probably can't see behind us, right? We don't have eyes in front of our head. And unless we look to the right or we look to the left, we probably can only see so much at a time, right? So I've decided to draw this little cone here. I'm going to draw my picture. I'm going to pretend like if you were looking straight ahead, you probably couldn't see anything outside of what you can see in front of you. In fact, that's probably even really wide. Probably more like that is all you can see. So if, that, if we're thinking about that, for that, that's the uh, information that we need to draw over here. And this person, this um, mini mini figure here, is the star on this picture. I think that we can we can assume that the monkey bars are going to be over here. That the swing is probably going to be about here, right? So monkey bars, swing. The big climbing area is going to be over here. And then we're going to see some of the fence that is over here. 
So that's just me quickly going, okay, I think that's what we're going to see. We probably won't see more than that. But the pitcher's mound, if we were going to some of this, or the, the bases, if this is now starting to get to the sky, right, and we're looking at this landscape as an example, right, we're getting closer to the sky over here, we probably can't put the base up here, right? The base is probably more like down here on the ground. And the fence starts behind it and comes over like this. This is why I was saying that this act of drawing perspective with things far away is something that artists practice their whole life to try and figure out how they can draw things easily to make it look like um, things are far away so that everything doesn't have the same depth, so that it doesn't look like everything's right in front of you. So I kind of made this, this line here, and that's a, that's a bigger lesson, but how, how are you drawing it? How are you showing that the fence is really far away from where you're standing in, in the picture? And you might draw it a different way. So I've got my first base, I've got this base over here because it's a little bigger, I've got part of the third base because we can only really see a little bit of it over here, it's almost at the edge of the drawing. And then we had this border that was around the outside of the playground. I'm gonna go like that, right? And the swings over here, they're in front of the, of the climbing gym. So I'm gonna put the climbing gym here. And look, we only saw uh, on top of it. Now that I'm looking at it on the side, how does it look different? I'm gonna assume that it's actually up high because we need, we need a, a place for the slide to come down over here, right? And so that means I've added some legs under here, underneath where the climbing area is. And then we had the nets. And now in front of this, but a little bit bigger, right? Because this is closer to us and this is farther away. So I can draw the swings bigger than the climbing area behind it. And when you're starting to draw, sometimes drawing further things away first before you draw the things that are closer can help you figure out um, sizes as you go along, right? And this takes practice, as I said. There are, there are um, adults who have to practice this all their life. And even, even people who draw for a living, uh, perspective is one of those things that they have to practice a lot. So don't worry if it doesn't look great. Remember, we're just trying things for practice. So we have the climbing gym, then I've got my swings, and then the monkey bars. And so the monkey bars have the back of the monkey bars, which are gonna be smaller than the front of the monkey bars, right? because the monkey bar is here, this spot right here is going to be closer than this spot right here. So these monkey bars at the back are smaller than the ones at the front. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna add my grass. Real fast, right? Just trying this out. And there we go. Yeah, I'm gonna add some, some grass over here as if we were looking at it on the side because we had some grass over there. Okay, so can you see how, so if you were standing there or you were standing there, when you're drawing um, landscape, there's really two ways that you can be doing it. You can be looking at it like a bird and they call this the bird's eye view from looking above. And you could be uh, drawing a map making a plan um, of, of an area. And then there's the landscape where you are pretending like uh, anybody who's looking at this is standing from the same place that you're imagining and they're looking out at the scene, which requires a different set of skills because now we're, we're talking about depth. We're talking about things that are far away being closer to the top of the page and things that are closer to us being closer to the bottom of the page and are bigger than when we draw them far away. So that's perspective and depth. And I wanted us to look at that before we go back to the drawing that I did really fast here. And yours probably looks different. I would love to see how your park looks like. If you drew a map or you draw a picture of your backyard, 
you can uh, post them in the comments. If you come back later, we would love to see what you drew um, or what you tried. And try it a couple of different times. Maybe the first time you draw your part, um, it doesn't look quite right. Maybe when you first practice perspective, the things that you drew far away are too big compared to the things that are close up. Try it again. What happens when you redraw this picture again? That you make the things that are far away smaller and the things that are closer bigger. And what if you did the difference? Or what if you uh, did the opposite? How would that look? Maybe it would look really weird. Maybe it would look really cool. But give it a shot all the way so that you can see what the difference is when you draw things small, far away, and big, um, big when they're closer up. A good example, actually, would be me pretend like there was a flower here. And so I'm close up to the flower here. And the flower might be this big because I'm right beside the flower. Big old tulip. There we go. So you can see it. But the the tulip, the same tulip that was all the way back there, it probably wouldn't be that same size again, right? It might that would mean it was really, really big far away. It would probably only be about this size. And even that's pretty big. There we go. Right? And so can you see how this same tulip? looks like it's really close. Not only is it because it's closer to the ground, so it's closer to me or where I'm standing, but also because that one's so far away, it's even further back than the climbing of the fence. And the fence is really, really big if I was really close to it. So you also want to make sure that the size, when you compare these two, if the fence is really big when you're standing next to it, the flower is really small, you probably want to make the flower even smaller than the largest item that you've put that you're comparing it to. And these are little tricks that when you're drawing these kind of things and you're trying to show perspective and depth or how far away or how close things are, those are tricks that you can use to keep going back and going, hmm, do I need to make this bigger? Do I need to make this smaller? In fact, relative to the size, I bet you anything with this fence probably would go right outside of my picture. Probably makes more sense that my fence is like this. And I'm going to fix it after the fact, and that's okay, because we're just trying things out. There you go. You know what? That looks more reasonable, like the fence, and I think the fence would go even further this way. So I'm just going to keep drawing the fence this way. Right? And you can just keep adding to these drawings, right? You don't have to finish. You can go back when you think of other things. You can use your eraser if you want to, if you want to try other things. But I always encourage just keep drawing on top, right? I didn't have to erase those lines. That's okay. I just drew right on top of them. So that's a really big fence. That seems more reasonable to the size of the flower and the size of the swings that I put there. Okay, so that was perspective and depth. So let's go back to looking at this picture that I drew really quickly. And if you want to just listen for a little bit and draw your own landscape, you can do that. Whether that's when you look outside your window, or maybe you took a trip one time when you were driving in a car or a school bus, or you were taking a a train somewhere and you looked out at the landscape if you've ever if you're near me so i i'm in as i said coast salish territory but specifically uh, in vancouver if you were to drive up the sea to sky highway up to squamish um, whistler you would go through these mountains and you would see the water to the side and you would see the mountains to to the other side um, and those are very specific to where I, where I live. But if you were to travel to somewhere else in the world, um, you might not see an ocean. You might not see the same kind of trees. Um, and so knowing the different things that grow or that are, that are the things that you find in places are very cool when you're looking at landscapes because you can look at the landscape and go, oh, this looks like where I live, so this is probably near me. And if it doesn't have those things that look like things that are near you, you can go, oh, well, this is probably far away. This is probably a place that I haven't been to um, or that I visited one time but isn't here. I want to take a second, um, and I will make sure that we have these in the comments. If you wanted to look more into painters, who have practiced or who are really good at practicing depth. So that was that perspective that we were looking at before. 
um, or overlapping planes. Um, you can check out a French painter. His name is Paul Cezanne. And a lot of Western art um, and art schooling talks about Cezanne and how he uh, worked with overlapping planes. But um, I'm also really fond of Chinese landscape paintings. And uh, one of my favorites is uh, Guo Zi. And that's uh, G U O space X I. And um, you can also see that in a lot of Chinese landscapes, and there's there's a whole bunch of different kinds of um, specifically ink. So I talked about that last week, right? The, the ink paintings um, for Chinese landscape as well. Um, you can really see how when they when they're drawing uh, a mountain how the trees, if there are trees in it, the trees that are close up versus the trees that are small and tiny on a mountain, or if um, it is a mountain or it's a big plain, how you can see the small villages or cities or towns or huts on a mountain, how small they are compared to maybe a bird or um, a branch or something that you see close up. And so you can find some really beautiful things um, when you look up landscapes uh, from places all around the world. One other really cool thing about uh, Chinese landscape art is, or, um, art is that um, the poetry will that, that was inspired or sometimes words or characters that um, they either thought about or uh, thought about before they were doing it were drawn or written right onto paintings. So some of the um, uh, brushwork paintings that you'll see will have poetry written in the corner. And if you don't understand uh, traditional Chinese, you might not be able to read it. But when you see those characters in the corner, um, whether it, uh, which is different from the chalk, right? So if you see a little, um, a little icon down at the bottom that is bright colored, it's like usually a picture and it has some characters in there, that's a signature. That's the artist's signature that they'll put on, on things. And there's a whole bunch of history about that that you can look into. But sometimes what they'll have is they'll have um, characters over at the side, usually in a blank space, and that's poetry. And so there, um, when you're looking at landscape, you can also be looking at writing when it comes to landscape. It's not just about the drawing. So there's, um, there's that act of the uh, Chinese poetry written on there. But then as you uh, look at Western art, remember I was talking about Cezanne, but a little bit further along, there was a, there was a time where poets, especially English poets, would go out into the countryside and they would be so overwhelmed and so inspired by what they saw, these beautiful places, um, that they would also write poetry about the land. So if you're looking at landscapes, you could also go and start reading some beautiful poetry about landscape as well. Okay. That was five minutes of me just telling you some really cool stuff about landscape. It's not just about drawing. You can definitely read a lot about um, landscape. Okay, I, where I was going a little bit earlier was identity, right? So this idea that when we look at a picture, we can we feel like we know that place. It's familiar. Even um, if we don't have a house there, it feels like home when we recognize things that we see in those landscapes. So. I want you to take a second and here let's grab another piece of paper and let's let's draw all the things that we can think of that uh, you would find in a landscape or you would find outside or yeah actually just outside wherever you live and yours is probably going to look different than mine i'm just going to use a pencil because that's nice and clear in the in the um, in the video here but Let's think about all the different things that we can we can find when we look outside. Yours, as I said, yours is probably going to look different. So I can find trees, and so I know I can find palm or um, pine trees or um, coniferous trees, the ones that have pine cones. So I'm going to draw quickly just a little a little pine tree. But I also know that you can find uh, maple, acorn, and chestnut trees. And they usually have branches like this with big fluffy leaves, especially in the summer um, and spring. And so I can find trees there. When I look up at the sky, 
I can find clouds. Right? And maybe your clouds look a little different where you are. So I'm going to keep talking about things that I find, but you keep drawing what you can think of. So what else can you find in the sky when you look up in the sky? I can see birds. I kind of drew this bee here as if they were flying. Do you know what? Also when I look up sometimes, I see power lines, right? So the lines, you know, that the telephone lines or the power lines that bring electricity, and the reason I was thinking about that was because sometimes I see birds on those power lines. So I'm going to draw birds landing and they're kind of talking on the power line there. There we go. And this is really fast, right? Really, really simple drawings. So I have uh, power lines. Actually, you know, sometimes they kind of look like that. I think that's a little clearer. Okay. So when I look up, I see power lines. I see birds, I see clouds. What else do you see? Sometimes I see a plane. You might be going, but Kay, we're talking about landscapes. Aren't those things that you see outside? Aren't those always, aren't they supposed to be natural? Are they supposed to be just like trees and plants and things like that? And yes, when we are talking about landscape, most people talk about things that are natural. Um, but that word natural is really interesting because just because uh, we're in nature doesn't mean that the things that are grown in a place, so when we're in a park or something like that, that they're necessarily, um, and I'm going to use that word indigenous, so they are native or that they were originally here. Sometimes you go to a park and you find a really beautiful tree and you learn more about that tree and you find out that that tree didn't, it didn't originate. It didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't born here or was it natural or if you go back far enough, somebody brought a sprout or a sapling or a seed with them where they came from. And then when they wanted to do their own garden, when they landscaped, right, which is different when we were looking at landscape, when we were talking about landscaping last week, sometimes you'll hear people talk about their landscaping their yard which means that they'll bring somebody in who brings in and plants bushes or puts new seed for the, for the grass, right? It's that word, landscape, means so many different things. And just because now you have a garden or you have trees growing on your property or on your schoolyard, or maybe your city has um, a, a reforestation um, initiative, so they're growing new trees to plant it up, doesn't mean that it had been, it had always been a forest there. So when we're looking at landscape, thinking about how human made objects, human presences um, is part of when we're looking at the land, because there's very few places on the planet now that don't have some example of humans living there or changing the land. So when I'm looking up at the sky, it's very difficult, especially in Vancouver, and where I live, I'm pretty close to our international airport, there are often planes in the sky for me. And that might not be the same for you, but it's definitely part of my landscape and it's definitely something I'm going to see when I look up in the sky. You don't want to look at it directly, but there's probably a sun, right? Unless it's raining and then there's more clouds. Or if you're looking up at the sky at night, because you can do a landscape in the daytime or the nighttime, and when we were talking about equivalence last week, that word equivalent, which means when you're doing something in multiple um, mediums, you could also draw the same landscape that you drew, something that you can see out of your bedroom or see out of your dorm room or see outside of your classroom. What would it look like at night? And even if you can't go back there to that same place and see it at night, maybe you don't have permission, what do you imagine looks different? What's different when you have a moon that's in your sky versus a sun that's in your sky. What happens when the moon is a quarter where you can only see part of it versus when you can see the whole moon, right? Or what happens when it's a new moon, which means that there's no moon at all? How does the landscape look different 
when you think about how the light is there. When I was talking about the power lines, you might also think of street lights. If you're drawing a neighborhood, right? Maybe there's a street light. Or if you're drawing a camp, campground, maybe there's a campfire. So I went from sky and now I'm thinking about light sources, right? Things that create light. So maybe it's a campfire. Or maybe in the backyard, um, you have one of those little, um, what are they called? Not stove, but um, not a furnace. Oh, I can't think of the word right now. But like something that provides heat or that you're, um, you're burning, burning wood in the backyard, right? So maybe it looks more like this. So light sources, maybe, maybe you are at a beach and they have torches, right? So you're at a beach that's outside. That's natural. You're, um, you're hopefully distanced by a bunch of different people, but the city has decided to throw uh, an event and maybe there's a torch that's uh, been put into the ground. Sometimes garden, uh, backyard gardens will have torches as well uh, around the pool. So different light sources that you can find outside. So trees, you know what, thinking more about trees, I also want to think about bushes, right? And so sometimes you've got bushes that are really big. Sometimes you have bushes that have berries on them, right? Sometimes um, if it's a yard, you might have a bush that has somebody who has um, manicured it or made sure that it was cut down and looks really clean. So maybe maybe it's cut so that it looks really sharp, right? Maybe it's just a rectangle of bushes. I'm gonna put some of the leaves in there to show like that. So I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep thinking about different things that I can see, out uh, see outside when I go outside, specifically where I am in Vancouver. But I also wanted before before uh, I did too much of this, I wanted to talk about this resource that I um, that I like using online, and it's called the BC Tree Guide. Um, and it's this little book that the government has scanned that if you ever wanted to go on a walk, a landscape walk, and go and see if you could figure out the different names of trees, um, learn more about how you can identify them just by their um, by their pine cones, by their leaf shape. Um, by the seeds that they put down in the fall. I really like to go out and collect uh, acorns and chestnuts um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But what this book does is it, it's, it's neat because um, it gives you all the things that you can look for, but it also shows, because these are illustrations, these aren't pictures in this book that somebody took a picture of and then just put it in that you can print it. Somebody had to draw these and so this is, this is cool because it gives you kind of a clue if you were ever wanted to draw a landscape that had different trees in them, the different ways that you could be drawing trees, right? So these are just a few pages. This is page eight and nine that I pulled from the BC uh, Tree Guide. And I think Leah is going to post the, the link. Yeah, cool, the link in our, um, in the Facebook comments. So, um, and I will also post that in the, the YouTube comments as well as well as on our website at artstarts.com slash explorers dash online. But you can see, right, if I was drawing a tree um, that had the, the maple leaves, that might be different than, I think this is an oak, an oak leaf. No, that's an oak leaf over here, right? So if I was drawing an oak tree versus a maple tree, right? Being able to know the different shapes is going to inform how I'm going to draw that tree or paint that tree or take a sketch of that tree. And so when you really start looking at landscapes and you start looking at the different kinds of trees, sure, when we first start drawing, we might just draw um, a circle for a tree, right? This is the bushy tree at the top. And this is a line and that could be a tree. But then an apple tree might, when you start looking, um, maybe it's still got the circle, but maybe it tends to have a bit more 
of uh, weight to the leaves, right, the, to the to the canopy, which causes it to droop down a little bit. And then when we put the apples on them, right, now we're showing that that is a fruit tree. That's almost the same shape. So when we first start, sure, when we're looking at a landscape, looking for uh, shapes, land, specifically um, land shapes, is really important when we're starting to learn and look at, at uh, landscapes. And when you're going fast, just being able to, to identify shapes really fast is a really easy way, um, especially if you don't have to draw a lot of detail, of making a forest, right? Look, so that's just lines and circles. And I've basically shown you that that's a forest there. But I'm not really showing you what kind of forest that is. And if we were close up, maybe it would be better to have a bunch of really prickly leaves to show that this is a maple tree. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be particular, especially if you're drawing a whole bunch of leaves, right? It would be, it would take forever if you wanted to draw one tree with just all, uh, all the leaves on it, right? It would be so hard. But if you just draw a few of those, and then draw a canopy around the outside. And then again, you have a rectangle at the bottom, right? That shows a little clearer what kind of tree that is compared to when we just had the circle and the line. And when you're really close up to a tree, you're probably going to see more detail. And check that out when you're looking, um, when you go out, and hopefully you do take a tree walk or you go to the park um, and you try these things plain air and you try to draw the things that you see. Try to draw something in nature that's really close up, that you're really close to and see what the details that you notice. And then when you walk really far away, you probably can't see some of those details, but you know those details in your head. So maybe it doesn't make sense to do the really close up leaves, but you can see how I'm layering them on top of each other. Somebody doesn't have to know, right? They don't have to see each individual leaf to know that this is a very healthy um, pointy leafed tree, right? Just by drawing all of these things. And you know the shape because you looked really close up to it. And that's going to make a much more a defined looking tree, a more realistic looking tree, right? Than that circle and that rectangle. But sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's okay to do that. So I encourage you to keep trying to draw all the different things that you can find out on, uh, outside when you look at a landscape. And then when you're all done, I encourage you to cut out a whole bunch of these things and make your own landscape. So whether you're doing it um, imagined or whether you're drawing it, uh, or whether you're outside and you want to match those things, you can make multiples. You can make a whole page of just clouds, right? And then just cut out a whole bunch of different clouds. You could do a whole page of suns or bushes, or whatever, to practice drawing each of these things. But then when you want to draw your final, your final landscape, you can go and, here, I don't have any scissors with me right now, but that's okay. I'm just gonna rip, because I always love to rip paper you could start adding them to the landscape that you drew before and see what it looks like. You could pretend to make your own version of a garden. What does your perfect garden look like? If you were gonna plan, if you were gonna plan a park, which of the things that you can normally find and see locally could you add, right? How natural, how how um, local could you make your park look? If you drew nothing but pictures um, from a trip, this can be a really fun game. If you're ever going on a family vacation or a school trip, drawing all the things that you can see outside, maybe just not in detail, but just a page of all the individual things you see when you come back from your trip. If you were going to make a collage or a picture, you could rip out each of those little things and put them together and then you'd have a remembered picture of all these things and maybe they weren't all in one picture but it's a memory collage landscape of everything that you did on your trip okay i have one more minute left before we wrap up this week's session and i just wanted to show you one more technique when we're doing landscapes and this is to show you that whole thing about not being precious and just trying out different things i wanted to show you that there is kind of three 
layers of depth in this painting or in this picture that I drew right here, right? So we've got this one right here, one, because this is the closest to us, right? It seems like this tree is probably really close to us. But then we have this middle section that's far back, but it's not so far back as the mountains. I'm gonna do a different color here, Let's take my green. And so kind of like I had this kind of mountain over here, or this hill over here, this hill over here, this hill over here. This is kind of the middle ground. This is the middle plane, right, over here. And this is behind this section here. And then back at the back, I'm gonna take one more color, one more color, maybe in purple, and show that these mountains here, these are even further back, right, behind everything else. So here I'm gonna go one, two, three, and I found one more thing. Can you tell which one it is? Will I look for another color? There we go. That's right, the sky, right? All the things that are behind the mountain, the clouds and the blue sky and everything like that, that's all back there. So if you wanted to practice layering these kind of things, what you could do is you could start finding those different pieces and either cutting or ripping them out. Well, I'm just ripping because you heard me say I, I didn't have my scissors this week. That's okay. We're doing this real fast in the last minute of the workshop, right? So that was the front ground. That was the foreground that's real close to us. And then I had the hills. Right, ripping real fast. Here we go. Those were the hills. Those were a little further back. And then I have the mountains. There we go. Okay, there are the mountains over there. And then the sky in the background. So to really get an idea of how they were all, they were all these layers, here, I'm just gonna find some paper over here. Here we go. So if you wanted to, what you could do is you could take all these different layers and you could stick them onto a new page. And I'm just gonna do this really, really fast, just using some tape here. And this was the sky layer, right? So you could then just pretend what happens if there were no hills or there were no mountains? What does the sky look like if, if you don't see anything else? And then all of a sudden you could be adding more clouds, right? Maybe the blue of the sky. This is, remember that um, all the icons we were drawing before, maybe this is where you would draw your, um, your airplane or some birds or stars if you're doing it at night or the sunshine, right? Maybe the sunshine is making a sunset and the sun is actually over here, right? Really far down on the horizon. And it's only kind of bright over here, right? But you can't really see it everywhere. So there's our sky. But now when we bring our mountains back into it, it's covering some of the sky, we understand how the, how the mountains are in front of the sky. So now we can take a new picture, right? I'm just going to pull this in half this is going real fast. Oh, I'm a little bit over. I'm sorry. So we're going to bring the mountains onto a new piece of paper, and we're going to draw all the mountains, right? So the mountains go probably really deep. We couldn't see the hills in front of them. Maybe these mountains would have trees on them down here, right? And so you could draw all of the trees that you see because we nothing's in the way. Now we can actually see all of the trees that we couldn't see before when the hills were in front. And part of this is using our imagination, right? So we're going real, really fast, drawing some trees here, right, that you wouldn't necessarily see. Maybe this was, uh, maybe this was last year, and so there's forest fires. So here the ground is kind of dark here from where there were some fires here, right? However you want to draw your mountain. And that's, and that's okay, right? Because we're just drawing whatever we can think of for the mountain. Now we've got the hills that come in here, so same thing, right? And there's a little bit more depth before. You can see the trees peeking out behind, which I didn't do when I was fast drawing here. So you can build your landscape by, by 
pretending to draw or to make these different pieces and then to layer them all together. And look, check that out. Doesn't that look like it's got a lot more depth, right? Doesn't it look a lot layered? Doesn't it look like you could walk right through those planes compared to when I was drawing it at the beginning? So it can be really fun to cut apart your picture and then go deeper to imagine what each of those layers might look like before you add the land or the pieces or the buildings um, on top of each other. So this is another way of practicing landscape. Thank you so much. I went five minutes over this week. Thank you for your patience. I hope you had a really great time as we explored landscape this week. We, we focused a lot on depth and, uh, and perspective. We talked about the icons or um, kind of things that you would see and how they, um, they have to do with place and identity. If you want to learn a little bit more and specifically uh, looking at Canadian landscape artists, what I, I recommend that you check out, there's the very popular, a lot of people know a lot about Emily Carr, who's a, fam a famous local as far as BC. Um, she lived in Victoria, but she was a, a colonial painter who did a lot of landscape work. Um, she spent some time with the, uh, the uh, on Euculet land and the people there. Um, so you can see a lot of landscapes that have um, an indigenous um, feel to them, but she herself was not indigenous. So if you wanted to compare Emily Carr, which you can find a lot of her paintings, to other artists who, who have been working and drawing the land, um, it can be really interesting to see the difference between somebody who uh, paints with a Western perspective or who learned in a Western school, uh, but was influenced by the local people, the local indigenous people. Even more interesting is when you look at the famous landscapes of, of the can Canadian landscape um, that we kind of recognize and around the world, if you went anywhere, most people would be able to go, ah, oh, that's Canada is that when you start looking at landscapes, specifically like Inuit landscapes, they look completely different because of all the snow, and because we don't have as much of a human presence there. And one of, um, one of the artists that I have recently been checking out a lot of, and I really like her because she does a lot of her work in pencil crayon, is Lucy Salia. And she is a, an Inuit artist who recently has started to show a bunch of her work in Toronto. Um, and both of those links should be showing up in the comments as well. So there's lots and lots and lots of landscape artists that you can be checking out that are Canadian, um, but I really do encourage you to look at the differences between each one of them and learn a bit more about the artists because the things that they choose to draw on the landscape has a lot to do with where they are in Canada, how they grew up, how they learned, and what access they had to education and to art supplies. So each landscape has all this history. Thank you so much. That was a really, really packed week. Next week, we're going to be exploring chants and we're gonna be a little bit more simple. This was a really heavy session. So thank you so much for the last two weeks of uh, landscape. This stuff is gonna stay up on Facebook. We're gonna post it on YouTube with captions and you can find it always at artstarts.com slash explores dash online. I'm gonna let the camera roll for a couple more minutes while I clean up because we always wanna clean up everything and throw it all into the recycling when we're finished. If you have any questions or comments, throw them up in the comments and I will be happy to respond to them. Uh, and Leah will be here for a little bit longer. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next week.